I'm Richard Clay. I'm the president and CEO of the Filson Historical Society. It's so good to have all of you with us this evening. Thank you for being here. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to recognize the sponsors of tonight's event and thank them for their generous support. This evening's lecture is sponsored by the Society of Colonial Wars in the Commonwealth of Kentucky and the General Society of Colonial Wars. We're very, very grateful to the warriors for their support. Thank you again for tonight's uh, please for joining us for tonight's presentation. I first heard about this book by Bob Drury and Tom Clavin, Blood and Treasure, Daniel Boone and the Fight for America's First Frontier, uh, while I was out with a friend of mine, Dick Burks, who's tuned in tonight, and he'd read the book, told me how wonderful it was, left a copy of it in my mailbox. Well, I read it, I got excited and I said, we've got to get these uh, speakers uh, to the Filson. We'd hoped to have them live and indeed now, COVID being what it is or was, we more than li likely could have. But uh, at the time, it seemed the better course of wisdom to follow the CDC guidelines and do this one by Zoom. Uh, in any event, it's a masterful book. It's going to be a great presentation. So thank you again for joining us. Tom Clavin will be speaking, although um, Bob Drury is in the audience and will contribute, I think, during the Q&A session. Tom is a number one New York Times bestselling author. He has worked as a newspaper editor, magazine writer, TV and radio commentator, and as a reporter for the New York Times. He's received awards from the Society of Professional Journalists, Marine Corps Heritage Foundation, and National Newspaper Association. His books include the best-selling Frontier Lawman Trilogy, Wild Bill, Dodge City, and Tombstone, and now Blood and Treasure with Bob Dury. I will return to moderate questions after the presentation as time permits, but for now, please join me in welcoming Tom Clavin. Tom? I'm here, thank you very much. Thank you for that introduction. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, I, I, I too wish that I was actually there at, uh, uh, at, at, at your facility and uh, to interact with people, but like you said, when these decisions had to be made, uh, most of us did not know what was gonna be happening. So uh, yes, the, the caution uh, is the best thing to do just in case. Um, I, <clears throat> I'm very happy to be talking about Blood and Treasure, a, a big reason being, I enjoy talking about the book anytime, but uh, Blood and Treasure came out in hardcover on April 20th of last year. And there was a good amount of excitement, uh, ended up on the New York Times bestseller list. Uh, Bob Drury and I together and separately did as best we could uh, all kinds of presentations. Uh, at that time, they were, if I remember correctly, they were all uh, still being done by Zoom. And, uh, and then a few months went by and okay, the book is still selling, but uh, there weren't too many requests to talk about Blood and Treasure anymore. So now that the trade paperback version is being published, and actually today, March 15, is that publication day for the trade paperback, uh, it's so good to be getting opportunities to talk about the book again and, and to maybe talk about it in a different way. Uh, when the book first came out um, and we were talking to different organizations uh, and groups around the country, we found that what was probably the best course of action was the straightforward approach that uh, uh, here's Daniel Boone, here's when he was born, here's where he grew up, here's what he did here, he did there. Um, here's uh, some of the adventures that he had and here's you know his later years. And it was pretty much a straightforward biography. And a reason why we had to do that is because we found, that we didn't do it all the time, but we did a lot we found that uh, a lot of, there's a lot of people in the country um, who, um, if, they're young, if they're young enough, Daniel Boone is a vague, famous, famous name. Oh yeah, he lived in the past, sometime in the past. 
and didn't he live in the woods? Uh, uh, but for other pe some other people who were a little older, uh, they would wonder about, well, uh, how old was Daniel Boone when he died at the Alamo? Uh, how old, what, what, what would, did Daniel Boone really wear, wear a coonskin cap? Um, so we realized that uh, for a lot of people, and I don't mean as a criticism, it's just that they both had a remarkable lives and, and even though we're not completely contemporaries, that their lives overlapped. Uh, Daniel Boone and Davy Crockett were interchangeable to, to a lot of people. And uh, that's not a caught necessarily because people didn't know any better, but uh, let's face it, for those of us who were young enough, uh, we could blame it on Fess Parker. Uh, back in the 1950s and into the 60s, I believe, uh, uh, Fess Parker portrayed uh, uh, D Daniel Boone in a movie and then the Davy Crockett television series, if I remember correctly, uh, I know when I was about five years old, I had a coonskin cap. And uh, however, I did, thankfully, over the years, learn the difference between D Daniel Boone and, and, and Davy Crockett. Now, certainly, I'm not going to give that kind of, you know, paint by numbers, the essentials, uh, basics about Daniel Boone to the Filson Historical Society. I'm assuming that uh, the members, uh, members of the society, anybody who's watching this has got a pretty good handle on Daniel Boone's life. So what I prefer to do in this particular talk is, is, is highlight maybe five aspects or angles to the book that I find were particularly rewarding to research and to write about and to talk about. And if I were to pick five things a year ago, I might pick three of those things differently. Uh, on any given day, sometimes I could, I could, I could do five different kinds of, of angles to the, to the Daniel Boone uh, uh, Blood and Treasure book. But as I was preparing for this, these, these were the five that, that really um, made an impression on me that I wanted to discuss. Um, one is that, <clears throat> how did we end up doing this book? Uh, we had done a book, some, some members of the audience may be familiar with this, uh, called uh, The Heart of Everything That Is. And it was the story of uh, it was it was the story of Red Cloud, who was a great Sioux Indian leader uh, in the 1860s, 1870s, 1850s. Uh, he was the only Native American leader to win a war against the U.S. government. And some of you might think, well, wait a minute, what about Little Bighorn? That didn't go so well for the, for the, for the cavalry. That was a battle. We're talking about there was actually a war, 1866 to 1868, and it was the U.S. government that sued for peace because they, they realized we can't defeat Red Cloud. And so, however, having said that, the book is a larger book than Red Cloud because we wanted to tell the story of what was really the last decade or two, last two or two decades of the power and the freedom of the Plains Indians in North and South Dakota, in Colorado, in Wyoming, in, in, in uh, Nebraska, where Red Cloud was born. And so Red Cloud was our guide to doing that. He was the one that uh, enabled us to tell this story, uh, a lot of it from the point of view of, of the, uh, the tribes. Um, and we uh, were kind of, um, uh, it was a kind of a bold step to write that kind of book because we hadn't necessarily done that kind of book before. We had done mostly military history. So uh, we wrote the book. I think our publisher was as surprised as we were when the book came out and it was very much embraced. Um, and it was six months on a New York Times bestseller list. And um, I always felt, you know, I don't want to speak for Bob. I suspect there was something that some, it was itching away at him too. But I always felt, gosh, I would like to we sort of told the story about the end of the really the 100 or 200, 300 year war, depending on your point of view, between the American settlers, Europe, European descent and the original inhabitants of America. Uh, I'd like to go back to an earlier part. How did, how did that sweep across the United States, what later, later became known as Manifest Destiny? How did that happen? Uh, where did it begin? Uh, when, was, when, it, when did it start to gain momentum? And that's when we thought about uh, doing a book about the period of the uh, 1750s, 1760s, 1770s, when people, settlers, farmers, explorers, uh, hunters were crossing over the mountains and starting to found settlements in, in Missouri, what became Missouri and Kentucky and the Ohio Valley. And so, so writing a book that had Daniel Boone as our main character was not how this book started, how Blood and Treasure started. 
it was when we thought about having a, a red cloud like guide, we didn't seem to have that same um, uh, composite prominent Indian leader that we can put that, put a lot of that weight on. But Daniel Boone, which brings me, eases me into my second point. Um, Daniel Boone checked off so many boxes for us. Um, as far as having somebody who we thought would, first of all, he was a recognizable name. Even if some people can get confused about what with him with Davy Crockett, Daniel Boone name resonates to this, you know, hundreds of years after, after he had his, his heyday, so to speak. So um, he, he was, he was a, a, a legend, even in his own time. Uh, uh, that, that's not, not certainly not news to people in the Filson Historical Society, because John Filson was part of creating that, that, that uh, attention that Daniel Boone got when he was still alive. Of course, a lot more of it came after his death. Um, <clears throat> and he also spanned, you know, at a time when the average age for an American male was probably, you know, lifespan was probably maybe still but under 50. You know, Daniel Boone was born in 1834 and he died in 1820. He was in his 86th year when he died. He was in, had an extraordinarily long life. And during that long life, he had all kinds of uh, ad adventures. And so to me, to us, to Bob and I, to be able to write about this person and, and touch on all these adventures that he had, or as many of them we could fit into a book, we, you, we could have easily doubled the size of this book. Uh, but from, from, from example, his early days when he learned how to hunt and, be, and became an expert sharpshooter and and uh, was helped support his family because he was such a good hunter. And the, the move that they made, he was born in Pennsylvania and then the move to North Carolina and then his restlessness that he wanted to find out more. Uh, we have the, the Braddock, the ill-fated Braddock campaign when General Braddock was, was uh, sent into the, towards Pittsburgh, what was then Pittsburgh, or called Pittsburgh, we'll call it Pittsburgh later. Uh, and what a disaster that was. And you had a member of that, two members of that expedition were Daniel Boone and George Washington, both of whom barely survived when the, court, when the uh, uh, Braddock uh, 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 troop was, was mostly massacred by the Indians. And um, so you have involved with Braddock, we have him involved with uh, uh, other aspects of the French and Indian War. He was part of the, of the militia in, in North Carolina and Virginia. Um, he participated in the Revolutionary War, and I'll get to that in just a minute because that's like point number three. Um, he was uh, after the Revolutionary War. He he was uh, he served as a, as a lawmaker, as a, tried to do, go back to farming. He was a businessman, not a very good businessman, but he was a businessman. He he moved to Missouri uh, when it was still part of Spain or the Spanish territories in North America. Uh, and he spent the last 20 years of his life in Missouri. And towards the end of his life, he wasn't just sitting in a rocking chair staring at the fire. I'm sure there was some of that when his arthritis and his rheumatism and everything else kicked up, but at, at old wounds from battles. Um, but he, he would still go on these long hunts he, into his 70s. Uh, there's one which we include in the book. There's one story which seems to be far-fetched, but there, there are some reasons to believe it that on one of his last hunts, uh, he was in his 70s, he made it as far as Yellowstone. And um, uh, so he, he's, he's someone in the age of when there's no speedy transportation, you know, your, your legs, your horse, your mule were your transportation. He just covered so much mileage and so much of the, of the uh, what was the uh, North America and, and then became the United States. Um, the third point that I wanted to say that was very, very enlightening, informative, and exciting for Bob Drury and I uh, is that Daniel Boone, I think, has been uh, kind of overlooked in his contribution to the um, Revolutionary War, uh, the successful outcome for the Americans, anyway, of the Revolutionary War. Bob and I had done our, our previous book was uh, was called was Valley Forge. And that was our first time really delving into the 1700s uh, in the United States. And it was, uh, again, a recognizable name. Uh, one of the joys of that book was that uh, uh, to, to pull together uh, un with, with George Washington as our lead character, surrounded by people like Alexander Hamilton and uh, Mad Anthony Wayne and John Lawrence and uh, some of the others, uh, uh, Gates and, and his other generals. Um, 
but Valley Forge, we believe, and we think our book makes a good case for it, was the pivotal experience in the American Revolution. Uh, I won't go too much into a sidebar on this, but uh, in December 19, uh, 1777, George Washington and his 12,000 men went into their winter quarters in Valley Forge. And when the winter quarters were over in the spring, uh, 2,000 of his men had died. Um, it was, it was the, the survival, the, the courageous and remarkable, and as far as the British were concerned, unanticipated survival of the Continental Army at Valley Forge allowed the revolution to continue because it was quite possible if, if and we go into more, obviously more detail in the book, uh, some of the battles that led up to it, what was going on during that. Uh, we even cover Franklin and Paris working out the arrangement with the French government to enter the war. Uh, if they had not survived, there would not have been a Continental Army come spring, and, and by default, the British would have suppressed the American Revolution. So we found when we were writing about researching Daniel Boone, he also played an important role, uh, which we didn't expect, but to make that connection between our previous book, Valley Forge, and, and, and Blood and Treasure was, was quite enjoyable. Uh, Boone was, uh, 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 he and other settlers founded the settlement called Boonesboro. I don't have to really describe what Boonesboro, what Fort Boonesboro, let's put it that way. And um, there, it was one of several, I think as many as 10 or even 12 settlements in Kentucky uh, when the American Revolution began, but with the British coming down from Detroit with their uh, the tribal al uh, allies, uh, one by one, the forts were either abandoned or taken over. and. It really came down to, I think, uh, Boonesboro, Harrodsburg, and there may have been one other uh, station uh, that remained in the hands of, of the American colonists. And Boonesboro, by the nature of Daniel Boone being the, the leader in Boonesboro, um, uh, was, even just from a psychological perspective, it need, needed to hold. It couldn't give in. It couldn't be abandoned. And so uh, what, what happened in, in, in 1778, in that summer, is that finally uh, the Shawnee and other affiliated tribes and their British uh, backers uh, arrived at Boonesboro and put, you know, was under siege. Uh, there was a lot of fighting that went on. Uh, there's even a part of the Boonesboro uh, story is that um, uh, Boone, one of Daniel Boone's good friends, very good friends was Simon Kenton, who was kind of a legendary frontiersman of his own. And at one point uh, during a fight with Indians, Boone is, uh, his ankle is broken by a bullet and he's almost getting almost surrounded by uh, uh, Indian warriors. And Simon Kenton comes in, shoots one, you know, swings his club, his gun like a club to, to attack others, lifts Boone up over his shoulder and high, hightails it back to the fort where he survived. And, uh, and when the siege was over and, and the colonists, the Boone and the other settlers and colonists were still there and alive, that was a, uh, I, we think, a very pivotal moment because if Boonesboro had fallen, if the Indians had been able to sweep through and their British allies had been able to sweep through Kentucky, it's quite possible that they would have been able to attack or go over the mountains and attack George Washington's Continental Army from the West. And Washington was having a difficult enough time in 1777, 1778, 1779, uh, fighting the British in, in the New York area, in New Jersey, in, in Virginia, that uh, he could not have won a two-front war. He barely won the one he had. And so uh, to, to write about the Revolutionary War and Daniel Boone's participation was, was really a, a, a lot of fun. And we think an aspect of his, of his life that a lot of people may not quite realize. Um, the fourth uh, uh, aspect of the book that I wanted to, to bring up is that we, as we delve deeper into the period of the 1750s and 60s and 70s and 80s and, and more about Daniel Boone's life and more about events and experiences, uh, we kept collecting, so to speak, these fascinating characters. I mean, both Indian and white uh, that made for just a stronger, more, I don't mean this in a political sense, more democratic story in that there were so many other people involved in this story. Again, it wasn't just Daniel Boone, it was the, the, the story of an era uh, in America. Uh, George Rogers Clark uh, being those, I mentioned Simon Kenton, 
there was uh, uh, Daniel Morgan, a cousin of Daniel Boone's, uh, who is a legend, also a legendary frontiersman in his adventures with, with his cousin, Daniel Boone. Uh, we had the, uh, the Indian, Shawnee Indian leader, Blackfish. We had another Indian leader, Cornstalk. Uh, we had the very young Tecumseh uh, as, as a character in the book. Um, uh, generals, uh, Lord Dunmore, uh, 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 British governors like, like Dunmore. Um, Henry Clinton, the, the man who decided to abandon Philadelphia and take his troops through New Jersey to New York, which brought about the climactic battle of the, of the at least part of the American Revolution in um, uh, Monmouth Courthouse. Um, the, the, uh, um, the, the characters kept coming along and we weave them into the story. Uh, and I mentioned about the, the Indian characters. Uh, we also found that Boone was kind of a man out of his time in his attitudes about and his interactions with uh, the Native American population. Uh, he did not seem to have, I don't want to say he was somebody without any prejudice at all. I think it would be impossible to be in 1700s America uh, and, and be able to be like that. Uh, but he had grown up on the frontier. He, he from, the, from being a very child, uh, he is, uh, uh, he was encountering Indians of different tribes. Uh, and that only became more so as he kept moving west and, and was encountering more Indians. He admired them. Uh, he, he admired their, their woodsmanship, uh, their ability to survive, their, their intelligence, uh, their, their, communion with the natural world, their spirituality, uh, he thought was very interesting. And uh, we, he would sometimes, he would sometimes say, I think it's the equal of ours, you know, we just look at things in a different way, but it, it all, the bottom line is all the same eventually. You know, there is some greater being, but we don't, not, don't understand it very much. And um, that was kind of unusual at a time when a lot of uh, uh, the attitudes of, of, of both American and British uh, governors and generals uh, was that the Indians were all savages. We, they didn't understand them. So if you don't understand them and they seem primitive, they must be you know, so, somewhere below human, not quite animal, somewhere in between. But Boone was, did not feel that way. Um, and uh, he, had, he had friendships with a lot of uh, Indian leaders. I mean, one of his experiences was being uh, adopted by, by Blackfish, the, the Shawnee and his wife. Now, Boone did not apply for, he did not submit an adoption application for this, but uh, he and, and, and some others were kidnapped in February, 1778. And uh, Blackfish selected Boone, who was the big prize, uh, to adopt him as a son. And, and for months, Boone lived with the Shawnee as the son of Blackfish and his wife. Uh, he was also, he was known to many there were times when he, his life was probably spared when he was in a vulnerable situation with, with, with Indians because they knew he was Daniel Boone and they knew he was of a different stripe of man. So that became an important part of the story too because through Boone, in addition, in addition to Boone and also through Boone, uh, we were able to tell a lot about the, the Shawnee and, and other tribes that inhabited the Ohio Valley and and the uh, and, and Kentucky and what became Missouri, uh, all the way down to Florida. Because one of Boone's trips was down to uh, the Florida, where he actually bought property. He expected at one point he was going to relocate to Florida. Um, the the fifth uh, aspect of it is uh, is uh, Boone as action figure. Um, Boone was a very active person. Uh, he was constantly on long hunts, uh, uh, he was exploring. He was a great curiosity, uh, had a restlessness. I mean, in a lot of ways he embodied the, the, the people of his time who wanted to find out what was on, over the next hill. Uh, I think it was Lord Dunmore who's quoted in the book as saying with Americans, they're never satisfied with what they have. They're, they always want to find out what's on the other side of the next hill. And that was definitely uh, uh, Daniel Boone. But there are a number of scenes in the book where he is, uh, at, you know, at war in combat uh, or something close to it. I mentioned the Braddock expedition. I mean, he barely survived that. He had survived that by the skin of his teeth. 
Uh, we have uh, other battles in the uh, French and Indian Wars. We have other battles that took place that he was involved with, even peripherally in the Revolutionary War. Uh, he was part of the George Rogers Clark expedition towards the end of the war that very effectively uh, kicked the Shawnee out of, uh, of the area. And um, perhaps his most famous, I mean, certainly because of our popular culture, um, our most famous, his most famous adventure as an action figure was when his daughter Jemima was kidnapped. And this uh, was in, in, in 1776, uh, Boonesboro had been built, Fort Boonesboro. And uh, this is probably not an obscure story. Uh, in, in fact, uh, uh, there was a book that came out last year. The entire book was the abduction of Jemima Boone. Now, I haven't had a chance to read it. I want to. Uh, it, it got a lot of wonderful reviews and was covered quite a bit. So it sounds like it, it'd definitely be worth reading. But uh, for us, giving the, the broader picture and trying to cover most of Boone's life, it was a chapter. But it was a very exciting chapter. You know, Jemima, who was, I think, 13 at the time, and two, two of her friends who were sisters, I think they were 13 and 14, the Callaway sisters, were in a boat that was floating across the water. And when they got to the other side, they were not quite mindful that they were in a dangerous position and sort of waiting for them uh, was, was a small group of Indians who captured the girls and took off with them. And uh, many times that would have been either a recipe for uh, eventually finding their bodies or they would have been taken and, and adopted. Um, and grown up to spend the rest of their growing up years uh, as part of a, a tribe. Uh, but Boone was not going to let his daughter uh, get away, uh, his favorite daughter really, uh, get away. So he went and he, with others, he, but he led the way. And I think it took them like three days of tracking through the woods. And he finally, they finally caught up with a group of Indians and rescued the girls. So it's a rather exciting uh, chapter in Boone's life that shows um, it's sort of like the kind of, of story that um, some, maybe some of the Natty Bumpo stories of James Fenimore Cooper uh, based on, on Daniel Boone's adventures. And uh, some people might remember the, the movie that's about 25 years old with Daniel Day-Lewis, The Last of the Mohicans. I mean, at that point in his life, Daniel Boone and, and Daniel Day-Lewis could have possibly been, been twins, maybe not quite as romantic and not probably not quite as as clean from being a year or two years in the woods. Um, so Boone is action figure, I think is the fifth element of it. And um, if I could offer a bonus one, because there was, there, there were actually seven or eight I wanted to get into this, but I thought, no, that's gonna go on too long, at least to explain things, I think thoroughly enough. But if I can be allowed a bonus uh, uh, angle or, or ingredient to the book that we found very fascinating, is the relationship with between, between Daniel Boone and his family. Um, I mentioned that, that Jemima was his favorite daughter. Uh, he, he was very close, and this is surprising, but I think it says a lot about Daniel Boone, that he would be gone from home for long periods of time, but he, his relationship with his children, you know, sons and daughters, uh, was, was very strong and very loving. And um, he lost two sons, to in, in fighting. Uh, one was his, his oldest son, James, when he was only 16, was, was, was killed in a, fight, in a fight with Indians. And then uh, another one of his sons, uh, Israel, was killed uh, during the, the uh, a, a battle of, uh, in, in Kentucky late in the war that was really an ill-advised uh, kind of fight. The, the, the colonists were a little too impetuous and, and basically ran into a trap. And and, and Boone's son was, was killed and, and you know, died in his arms, basically. He had that, and, and so uh, that affected him for the rest of his life. That's where, towards the end of the book, um, Boone, the, the title of our book, Blood and Treasure, comes from something Daniel Boone said. He's an older man. He's reflecting back on his life and how the, the, his accomplishments, his achievements, uh, the founding and, and the, the populating of Kentucky, uh, it cost a lot in blood and treasure. Uh, the blood being his own sons. Uh, he also lost a daughter too. Uh, and, and treasure being, uh, you could take that literally, he did not end up, he did not die a rich man by any means. Uh, he had a lot of struggles as a businessman. So it cost him a lot of property. It cost him a lot of money. Um, but just getting back very quickly to um, Jemima, um, Boone and Rebecca Boone, Daniel and Re Re Rebecca Boone were married for 56 years. And from all accounts, it was a very uh, loving and devoted 
uh, relationship. However, um, there was one uh, one time when there could have been a very serious breach uh, in this relationship. And that's putting it mildly. Uh, when um, it was in the in the 1760s, and uh, I'm going to say early 1760s, uh, Boone was on a one of his long hunts that turned into one of his really long hunts. I think it was like 18 months, and also word had filtered back uh, to Rebecca Boone that uh, her husband had died. Um, you know, wasn't quite completely reliable, but that was the word. He, he, and, and the longer he was away, the more credence there seemed to be to that story. So finally, uh, Boone emerges from the, the forest and he makes his way home. And when he walks into his, his home, his cabin, there's Rebecca holding a baby. And uh, <clears throat> uh, as you can imagine, this was an awkward moment. And, and for many people it would have been the end of the marriage. But uh, he asked what, what this was all about. And Rebecca explained that uh, she thought he was dead. Uh, it's very, very difficult uh, for a widow with children to survive on their own. Uh, she was uh, comforted by uh, one, of, one of Daniel Boone's brothers, I think it was James. And uh, the result was a baby. And so Boone contemplated this for a bit. And he and uh, he sort of nodded ruefully and said, "Well, at least you kept it in the family." And that baby was Jemima, who turned out to be his his favorite child. And it was within Jemima's uh, uh, house that he spent a lot of his last years. Uh, I mean, specifically, it was in his son Nathan's house, his youngest son, where he passed away in 1820. So, uh, you know, I want to make sure we have time for questions, uh, but I think that. Blood and treasure turned out to be um, I think that the, the blood and treasure was a much more of a voyage of discovery than we anticipated. We had no idea, even though we we consider ourselves good amateur historians uh, the the scope and breadth and 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 excitement and drama uh, and achievement of Daniel Boone's life. Uh, we, we had no idea about the Indian tribes and, and their predicaments and this, the pressure they were under uh, the, to either surrender or move farther west. Uh, we didn't really know that much about these other characters. I mean, considering that everybody was in the, way off in the woods, how many times people encountered each other. Uh, you know, Boone encountered an Irishman named Finley, who was the first one to tell him about this myth, almost mythical land called Kentucky. And Boone vowed right then and there he's going to see it one day. Um, and eventually made it through the Cumberland Gap and, and paved a way for others to follow. So it was it was uh, uh, it was quite exciting to do to do Blood and Treasure, learn more about it, have a greater appreciation for Daniel Boone, and then the same thing happened. Almost the same thing happened as happened with the heart of everything that is, which is how I, I started this talk. Uh, Blood and Treasure came out and it got this fantastic, you know, review by the wonderful historical writer Peter Cousins in the Wall Street Journal. And the talks that we were doing, people were saying, "Yes, it's packed with information and there's a lot of research you guys must have done." But gosh, it's a good story. And I, you know, ultimately, I think when you're a writer, there's probably no higher compliment you could get when somebody reads something of yours and says. Darn, that was a good story. So thank you. I'd like to turn this back over to uh, Mr. Clay and whoever wants to ask me some questions, I'm all set. Tom, thank you so much. Very, very good presentation. Thank and you. we do have some questions um, from Dennis Jennings. Did you find a lot of correspondence that Boone wrote to the family or other people? Well, Boone was uh, Boone had been taught to write a very rudimentary way by one of his cousins, if I remember correctly. So he was never one of a much of a writer. Now, I'm not saying he never wrote anything. There are some examples of Boone writing uh, a couple of letters here and there, but unfortunately for his family, he didn't keep in touch through the very pre prehistoric at that time postal system that the colonies and eventually America had. Uh, so that was unfortunately not not the way he corresponded. But uh, I, I should point out one a major way in, in, in addition 
um, um, to to John Filson that we know as much as we know, or a lot of that we know about uh, Daniel Boone is I want to mention Lyman Draper. And Lyman Draper, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with that name, Draper uh, was devoted himself. Uh, now he started this project after he did not get a chance to interview Boone. He started this project after Boone had died, but he devoted himself to writing this massive biography of, of Daniel Boone. So he set out to interview and collect as much material as possible, interview anybody who had known Daniel Boone. And he, he was able to interview uh, uh, Nathan Boone and his wife. And uh, he, he believes that he logged on his horse about 50,000 miles in, 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 uh, in, in search of this Daniel Boone biography. And he was all set. And he started writing it and he got writer's block. And, and really, I'm talking about really bad writer's block. He never completed his biography, unfortunately, but of all places, perhaps the greatest repository of Daniel Boone documents and information is in, unfortunately, not Kentucky or Missouri, but in the Wisconsin Historical Society. Yeah. So, uh, so I wish I could say, yes, here's where you could find a whole tr treasure trove of Boone letters, but they don't really exist. Here's one from Debbie Heaton. Um, what about Mikaja Calloway? I may have mispronounced her first name. Um, Callaway. Well, there's a family called Callaway that was part of Boonesboro. And in fact, the, the, uh, the, the Callaway patriarch and Boone were at odds with each other. Callaway was the older man, but Boone was really the one in charge. Callaway had, had I think, was a colonel or a major or something like that. So, and he was the one, two of his daughters were the ones who were captured with Jemima. So obviously, Callaway always felt indebted to Boone for bringing his daughters back, as well as Boone's own daughter. Uh, but and and then I think, if I remember correctly, uh, it was Jemima ended up marrying into the Callaway family. Uh, so if I do remember correctly, because a, a teenage Callaway boy was one of the rescuers who went with Daniel Boone to 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 find and and return uh, his sisters and Jemima, and I guess that was a you know, swept her off her feet, so to speak, and they were married about a year later. Um, then from Jim and Sarah Haynes, th this deals with alliances formed either by the French or subsequently with the British uh, with Native Americans. Um, yeah. how, how did those alliances come about? Well, you know, originally there's a lot of moving parts in the 1750s and 60s and, and 70s in America because of uh, really as a result of what was going on in Europe. Uh, we call it the French and Indian War. They called it something else in Europe, the Seven Years War, I think they called it there. Um, the, the French initially had the, uh, the inn, let's say, with, with many of the uh, uh, Indian tribes, which, uh, which was then the frontier. And a big reason why is that they were very um, uh, quick to give gifts. That was their way. And that the Indians were oppressed by these gifts. I mean, the, uh, it was a sign of respect. It was a sign of cooperation. Uh, and let's face it, it was also a payoff. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll align ourselves with you against the Americans, against the colonists, or against the British, because you treat us so well. Um, but then the French, uh, especially, I mean, especially, after they lost the French and Indian War from 1763, uh, even as they were losing that war, the Indian tribes, uh, these, their leaders who, who were you know, in, in, intelligent men, uh, most, most of them weren't men, said, you know, the French are, looks like they're losing this. We better reconfigure here who we're gonna you know, cast our lot with. And the British were not the kind to give, to give gifts, but what they did have the ability to do was say, we're, we're, the, we're the stronger, we're becoming stronger and stronger, the French becoming weaker. So if you want to be on the winning side and have help from us taking back the lands that the colonists, the white colonists have taken from you, you better align yourself with us. So there were shifting loyalties here that were you know, pr produced by uh, economics and, and political and military uh, changes. Um. How, what impact did Simon Kenton have on Boone's life? Well, Simon Kenton was a, a, a rascal. He was a, he, he was a big, brawny, brawny guy. He was a rascal. Uh, he 
when when Boone and he was he was a frontiersman like Boone, he was very comfortable spending years at a time in in the woods on these hunting expeditions. Um, I think Boone found a kindred spirit, a very restless man. Uh, he too had a family, uh, but um, uh, he had at first a, an illegitimate child. Then he had, a, I think, four children with his first wife and six children with his second wife. So obviously he didn't spend all his time hunting. Um, but uh, <clears throat> I think Boone found a kindred spirit in Simon Kenton because they both probably were the most comfortable they ever were, was not sitting by the fire in a cabin, was being out in the woods. And, uh, and Kenton and Boone remained friends, I think if I remember correctly, in Boone's later years, they were both older men. Uh, Boone and Kenton went on one more long hunt together. And that's kind of a, kind of a poignant aspect to their lives and their friendship. Wow. I have a question for you. How come you let this guy Drury get a byline when it's obvious you, you do all the work? Oh, okay. Yeah, you were supposed to not, you were supposed to be muted so I could take a complete credit for the book. They made him a co-host. Yeah, oh, that's that's oh, he, dirty dog. He got around that one, huh? Yeah, you know, we we we. I think uh, you know all the books that we've done together. Blood and Treasure was our seventh collaboration. All the books we've, we've done together have been enjoyable stories for one reason or another. Uh, I, again, I go back to thinking about how surprised we were in Blood and Treasure. The more we found out, the more we wanted to find out. Uh, you just kept getting hungrier for more, and there was more there. Uh, and and thankfully, and I always do this, and you know, Bob knows I do this. Thank you, thank you, thank you to curators, reference librarians, other librarians and institutions, uh, Filson Historical Society, other places, the Wisconsin Historical Society, all obviously the uh, uh, state, park park state and federal park rangers too. Yes, the park rangers are great. They're wonderful uh, storytellers. And knowledgeable ones too, so we we were not acting, researching and writing in a vacuum here. Uh, we were able to tap some really good sources, and 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 we all sort of felt too. There's such a good story here. Don't get in the way of it. Don't try and overwrite it. Don't try and over research it. At some point, you have to sort of put the research aside. And let's tell the story, and and then as as Bob's writing and, and we're producing pages. Uh, it just kept getting better and better. And we, we uh, you know, I, I wish I could say that we suffered and struggled and had to draw this out of us by, by the, the, the very edge of our strength. We love working on this book. Well, it's obviously, let me, let me uh, ask both of you a question, but premise it with what I'm about to say. Mm -hmm. um, like you, Tom, I had a Davy Crockett coonskin cap. <laughs> and I had a fort that I defended with my friends against Indian attack. Uh, we The attacks generally were fueled by green walnuts, <laughs> uh, sometimes by BB guns that weren't loaded with ammunition. Um, but we had a great time doing it. The, the thing that I'm struggling with here goes to something that the Filson has just started. We have $250,000 of grants uh, from two wonderful foundations to study the Filson's collection of materials from indigenous people. A part of that study will be conforming to NAGPRA, the Native um, American uh, Protection uh, and Grave Act. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we will be repatriating a number of those materials back to tribal authorities. And we'll work on what is legitimately ours to keep and what we can display. Uh, we will engage the public in all of this because it's a public exercise and we're a public collecting institution. It's, it's really exciting. Mm. All of this, my coonskin cap, the repatriating that we'll be doing, the work we'll do with the tribal authorities leads me to a statement in your all's book mm -hmm. um, that it, it basically says that uh, if you're looking at the Native Americans, and the very graphic, brutal attacks that you describe in the book. 
Um, an interesting thought experiment, quote, is to contemplate how a mob of white settlers might have dealt with uh, Native Americans uh, who'd been apprehended poaching animals from their property. What, I, I guess all of that long monologue is, what were Daniel Boone's views of the indigenous people, the Native Americans? I mean, he lost two sons to them. Mm -hmm. His daughter was uh, abducted. Mm -hmm. Yet earlier you said he had great admiration and respect for them. How did he square all of that? How did he deal with it? Um, can I can I jump in here? Because I this this kind of hits close to the bone. One of my favorite anecdotes is that when Boone and his uh, brother Squire and several other hunter several other hunters were first exploring what the uh, uh, what the several tribes, the Cherokee, the Shawnee, the Mingo, the Miami, called Kataki, uh, land of beautiful fields. Uh, he, this is anecdotal, Mr. Clay, but when he was caught, he was in there for almost two years and they were coming out with their pack horses laden laden with beaver pelts and with deer skin and the buffalo skin oh of course buffalo still roamed in kentucky then but they weren't worth taking out they were too heavy and he was caught by a hunting party of shawnee who basically said you're on our property give us those skins here we're going to give you two old flintlocks we're going to give you an extra pair of moccasins we're going to take your horses we're going to we're going to let you walk out of here that's our law and Boone was, if that is your law, that is your law. We are trespassing on your property. You are absolutely correct. And that's what led us to write that counterfactual, what would have happened if Native Americans had been caught poaching uh, uh, a Euro-American's farm? Do you think they would have been so uh, circumspect in obeying the law of that land. And uh, that's what always jumped out at me about Boone. I think Tom hit on this before. Boone was not a particularly religious man, but at one point he told, I think it was Peter Filson he told, uh, listen, I don't know much about the great, the Indian's great spirit or the Christian's God, but I'm willing to roll, I'm paraphrasing here, but I'm willing to roll with either one of them because it seems to me they're pretty much one and the same person or one and the same deity. So anyway, Tom, I didn't mean to interrupt, but that uh, Mr. Clay's question kind of hit home to me because I always remember that, how Boone respected the Indian unwritten law, you're on my land. I'm taking your stuff and I'm letting you go. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Go, uh, if you would, one of you describe for everybody, the the gruesome killing of his son James, and and then the very poignant, tragic unearthing of James's body in the double grave by Daniel. Hmm. Yeah, that was a tough. You know, we, for those who have not read the book, uh, the book our, our prologue opens with the sixteen year old James. Uh, and a companion being uh, attacked by a, a group of hunting Indians. <clears throat> and um, it was a multi multi war party, too. Yeah. Cherokee, Shawnee, mm -hmm. and Mingo, I believe. Right. And, and James um, um, was unable to escape. Uh, he was captured. And there was some torture involved, you know, pulling out the fingernails. Uh, uh, he was badly wounded, but not dead. So the the he, he was he was awake for some of the torture, and finally, as a as a mercy, you know, he was he was killed. And uh, Boone could not by himself have have I've gone to the rescue of his son, because he was one he was one person against a a whole group, uh, as Bob pointed out, a multi tribe a group of Indians. It would have been a kill. He would have been killed immediately himself. So. Um, <clears throat> He, he sort of marked the spot where, where you know, with James, he, he buried James when he found him. And then uh, several months later, uh, he returned to find the grave because he, he, it had only been a temporary grave, just enough so that the predator's animals would not get to get to the body. 
and and the the bodies I should say because of his companion, and uh, and then he went and he he redug the grave basically, and and uh, you know covered with a shroud his son and the son, and and then uh, it's it's quite a scene because he he's sitting there with with his son's body again you know holding it, and it starts to rain and he's the tears are coming down his face and so the tears and the rain are mixing as they're coming down his face. And that was, that was uh, I, I think it's a really good example of how deeply, Boone was an, a, an emotional man and loved his children very much. And, and to have one, his oldest, you know, who had been accompanying him on trips ever since he was like eight or nine years old. Uh, but what do you do at that time? That's, that's the brutality of the time. And, and you, you, you could not have, have found out more about the country you live in by staying at home all the time. Um, here's another question uh, from Chelsea Wilson, and that is, um, why is Boone's fame carried on to the present day? What makes him resonate with us in our times? I'll throw one, I'll throw yeah. one fact out there. Uh, of the 330 million Americans extent today, it is estimated that 46 million of them pass through the Boone Trace in the Cumberland Gap, which of course became the, the Westward Road. Had the ancestors, yeah. Yeah, so when you've got, uh, oh, Tom, my math is bad. What's 46 out of 330? But when you've got that many people who can owe their Westward uh, manifest destiny expansion to, to one man. And, and, and Tom and I, make, make no mistake, we do not say that Daniel Boone discovered the, uh, the Cumberland Gap. The, the Native Americans, indigenous people have been using it for millennia to raid each other. The Cherokees raiding north on the Shawnee, the Shawnees raiding south on the Cherokees and the Creek and the Chickamauga. But when you have one man who was cons kind of responsible in our uh, national lore for opening up the West. And don't forget, right then, West of the Appalachians was the West. You know, Indiana, Ohio, that was the old Northwest Territory. It's gonna, it, it's gonna stick. And that said, I think Tom, and probably Tom, you could elucidate it on this more. Tom mentioned it before. This guy, yes, he was, he was famous in his own time. But he was not a Kardashian. He was not famous for being famous. He was famous because he did things. Uh, uh, Tom? Yeah, he was a larger than life character, even so to, to during his, the time that he was alive and, and became, you could say, even more so afterwards. You know, he did, he, he did uh, have many, many adventures. There, the book uh, details all the times that he could have easily have been killed. Uh, he was in a very vulnerable situation. And... Um, and I said, as I said before, he, he was in his 86th year when he died. So he was a frontiersman and a, a representation of that generation of, of Americans that fought the American Revolution and were founding the country and, and founding uh, the, the states were opening up. There was settlement heading west. So I think there's kind of a, a bit of a romanticism to Daniel Boone, the, the, the woodsman who could always survive in the woods. And I think he once said, uh, there, have been, there have been times when I'm not sure where I am, but I've never been lost. Also, if I could just add one thing, Boone himself, uh, uh, Richard, you hit on this before, and of course, Tom spoke about it during his wonderful presentation. We have had American heroes throughout the, the well, even before this, this country was established. And at some point, it comes out that however soft their feet of clay was, they had feet of clay. How big was Custer? for quite some time until we learned more about Custer. And I think it's the measure of the man that Daniel Boone, let me just put this colloquially, he never turned out to be a jerk. Everything we know about Daniel Boone, he's not a jerk. Yeah, yeah, not, not flawless, but, he, but he, does, he does fit the definition of hero. I loved the story that you all told in the book about he comes back from a long hunt uh, to a barn dance. <laughs> Can you tell us about the scene between him and Rebecca in that? I, I think that will, <laughs> yeah, anyone I've, who's not read this book will will love this. 
I'm Tom, glad you mentioned, yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that because, you know, one of my points was about the relationship, the, the enduring relationship between Daniel Boone and Rebecca. And here he's been on one of his long hunts again. And I think he shows up, it's, it's, it's Christmas Day, it's Christmas Eve, something like that. And the community where his wife and younger children live are having this barn dance. Now, Boone is not shaved. His hair has grown out. He's filthy. He's, 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 his clothes were probably somewhat in rags from all the, the months and months of a year, however long he was away of, of being he out stinks. in the woods. <laughs> yeah, stinks. But, but, you know, there was, there was no uh, right guard available then. Uh, and he walks in, they're having the barn dance, and the people walks inside the building, and people are dancing. And he shuffles up to Rebecca to uh, ask her to dance. And she's a guest. Who is this? I mean, to be colloquial again, who is this bum? And why is he bothering me? <laughs> and so her, her expression, her being so appalled, is so funny to him that he starts laughing and she recognizes his laugh. And all of a sudden, oh my God, here's my husband back. back. Uh, thank, thank God for that. But what a character. Did he have children by Native American women? You know, I, he, he refers to, uh, he, he sort of admits at one point about dalliances with Indian women. Uh, I don't, I'm not aware, and I don't think there's anything in our book that he produced any children with Indian women. Although it, you, you would think if he has, he had dalliances with Indian women, some of whom may have gotten pregnant, they would just have been, you know, probably been part of the tribe and uh, there's no record keeping along those lines. So I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if that's the case, but we didn't find any, any, any strong evidence of that. Then we have one last question. And this is, um, where is Daniel Boone actually buried? <laughs> oh, it depends. If you're from Missouri, you say he's buried in Missouri. If you're from Kentucky, you say he's buried in Kentucky. What happened was is that uh, he and Rebecca were buried on a floodplain of the Missouri River. Uh, and at some point, the Kentucky legislature, I'm not sure, I don't think Missouri was a state yet, it was a territory. They paid the territory to exhume the bodies and, uh, and, and bring them back to, as you well know, where the Stella is, Daniel Boone's burial site. But the and, and no one's ever going to get to the truth, or maybe some archaeologists in the future will with, with advanced DNA. But apparently the Missourians were kind of snickering behind their hands because they had made this money and they had, and the floodplain had been overwashed so many times that they pointed the Kentuckians to the wrong graves and the Kentuckians took the wrong bones back. So, you know what, though, since we're talking to the Filson Society, I'm going to definitively state that Daniel Boone is buried in Kentucky. <laughs> Thank you. And very happy about it. Now, all right. One, one last two minute uh, thing for both. I mean, take two minutes and I'd like both of you to describe to us the process of how you research and write and divvy up the labor between yourselves. Tom sits back and eats bonbons, <laughs> smokes Havana cigars, and I do all the work. Tom, yeah, you're rebuilt. Well, you know, it's it's it's. I really enjoy when people ask this question because it, it is a natural curiosity thing. I mean, how to does, does does if you have two authors, does one write chapter one when the other one writes chapter two? Do you do you write do you alternate paragraphs? Uh, the very first book that Bob and I did was called Halsey's Typhoon. It was published in two thousand seven. And it's, a, again, a nonfiction true story about the, a typhoon that struck the third fleet under Admiral Halsey in December 1944, that three ships were sunk and about 800 sailors were killed. And we established a pattern right then that, that you can't have four hands on a keyboard. Bob I, Bob, I always felt this from the beginning. I thought Bob's style, more of a muscular style, was perfect for the kind of material that we were producing. I, I, one of the strange cats who enjoys research, I love burrowing into, into reference, reference rooms and the basement of Library of Congress and place like that. So uh, Bob does research too, but I try and do the bulk of it and then turn material over to Bob. He does the writing. And as he's, he's completing chunks of that, it goes back to me for reviewing, uh, you know, seeing if there's any red flags, fact checking, things like that. And it's, it's sort of like we just keep handing stuff off to each other. And here we are, you know, we, our eighth book is coming, is coming out in November and uh, it's a formula that's worked. 
It's kind of a Henry Ford assembly line. Tom is, as he said, he's such a wonderful researcher. Uh, I like researching. And if there are people, obviously not uh, in Blood and Treasure, but in Halsey's Typhoon, for instance, we uh, I would do the interviewing of the, a lot of the sailors who are still alive. The last Dana Fox company, I did the interviewing of the of the Marines who are still alive. But you send Tom anywhere out to any historical society, any library, national archives. I mean, I might get the same stuff, but you have to come find me with a miner's light around your head, whereas Tom just comes out with it. And so <laughs> I come, out, I come out with my pelts and skin, just like Daniel Boone emerged from the world. I think uh, we're living in an age desperately in need of heroes. And mm -hmm. you all have um, written about heroes. Yeah. Uh, Admiral Halsey being one of them. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much on behalf of the Filson Historical Society. It's been a joy to have you. And I really forward to bringing both of you back live and in person now that we're uh, open for business. Uh, uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Clay. Thank you. Thank, you, oh for, gosh. thank yeah. you for everyone who tuned in tonight. We really appreciate it. Absolutely. And thank you to uh, the Warriors, the uh, Society of Colonial Wars in the Commonwealth of Kentucky and the General Society of Colonial Wars for your all's wonderful, meaningful support not just for this lecture, but in others that you've sponsored. We really are grateful to you. Thanks everybody.